you in church this morning? How many of you know he is risen? Amen. Risen in what? He is risen. Amen. Amen. Pastor Dennis taught us that yesterday and this morning. Amen. Uh, I'm telling you, we need to, we need to, to know that he's risen. We need to, to know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And, uh, and, and we need to appreciate it, I think, more than we do. How many of you know this is not just a holiday? It's not just a holiday. You know, people get the day off and, and, and some people just, they don't know what it's about. And that's so sad. We need to get the word out more. Amen? Amen. Uh, I better pray before I start. Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you that Jesus is alive and that he's risen. And Father, I thank you for all that that means to me personally and to all of us individually, Father. And Lord, help us today to grasp something from your word that'll, that'll rejuvenate us more and, and make us more excited about the fact that, that Jesus rose from the dead and he is alive today and he's at your right hand making intercession for us even right now. Even though he gave his life for us, he died, he suffered, he's, he's still interceding for us because he loves us. And I thank you, Father, for your love. I thank you for your plan. And Lord, help us to... To, to be tuned in to your plan for the rest of our lives, Father. And let us, let us hear a word today that will turn our hearts more to you, Father, and get us more submitted to you and to your purpose and destiny for our individual lives, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, you know, it's really not just another holiday, and I don't know how many in, people in the world that... that don't understand and that just think it's just another holiday. And, and my heart cries for them because there's so much more that he has for us than what most of us reach out and, and take advantage of. Um, you know, I think John 3.16 is a, is a one verse summary of, of what Easter's all about. And uh, I wrestled with this message, and, uh, and I just pray that, that God will bring it forth so that it touches some hearts today. Amen? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, how many of y'all are a whosoever? Amen? He gave his only begotten son that all of us could, uh, could have eternal life. Whoever believes, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. In fact, he took the condemnation away from us, but that the world through him might be saved. And if you take the time to, to really look at that verse, it has a whole lot more stuff in it than what I think we, we normally get out of it. Uh, how many of you that, that have been coming here regularly for a while know what the definition of love is? Somebody, somebody tell me what love is. It's how you act. If you, go to, if, you, if you haven't seen that before, you go to 2 John verse 6, and it says, this is love that we act according to his commandments. So it's how we act. It's not how we feel. You know, you can feel horrible to somebody and still love them by acting right to them. And, and that's what this says God did. For God so acted right to the world that he gave, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, anybody, believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I wondered about why it said should, but you know, we should not perish because he did it. But the only reason we would perish is because we don't recognize that he did it and we don't surrender our lives to him and we don't take advantage of what he did on that cross for us. Amen? And it's there for all of us if we will, but just accept it. Amen? Uh, look at Luke 24, verse 1 to 9. It says, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, 
They and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happens as they were greatly perplexed about this that behold, two men stood in shining garments. And as they were afraid and, and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Just think about that. Why would we seek the living among the dead? Jesus had told them over and over that he was going to rise again, and, and they're perplexed. You know, we, we've got to learn to believe the truth. I mean, they, they, they walked and talked with him, and they heard him say it I don't know how many times, and they were perplexed. He's not here, but he's risen. Remember, he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered unto the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day and rise again. Amen? And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And their words seemed like them, seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. Who were the eleven? Were they the guys that lived with him for over three years? That walked and talked with him, that he taught daily, and that must have heard him say at least I don't know how many times that he was gonna have to be crucified and he was gonna rise again. And and then they hear this and and they don't get it. You know, so many people don't, don't get it still. And we've got to get it. We've got to do a better job of getting the word out and letting people hear the gospel. Uh, then uh, on, on the road to Emmaus, the guys were walking and, and one of them uh, after the road to Emmaus in, in, in Luke 24, 34, uh, one of them said, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. They began to get it after they began to see him. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. Uh, it's Paul. He's talking to some Gnostics that, that kind of came out of the, the worship of knowledge. And he tells them, he says, Now if Christ is preached, uh, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And did you ever stop to think what would, what we, where we'd be if he hadn't been raised from the dead? He's telling us right here. Uh, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we were found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most to be pitied. You know, I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about what the world would be like if Jesus, Jesus had not been born, come as a man, and if he had not died on the cross, if he had not been raised from the dead, um, what would this world be like? I think if, if we understood what it would be like without him, we might appreciate him more. Amen? Uh, and, and we personally, with our, on our own personal lives, we wouldn't have the more that he promised us. Amen. He wouldn't have the abundant life that he talked about. But look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. And this is Paul talking again. He says, For I delivered to you first of all 
that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, and then by the twelve, and after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain. In other words, they're still alive at that time. Uh, they remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Some of them, a few of them have died, but most of them were still there. After that, he was seen by James, then by the, all the apostles, and then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of time. Paul didn't have the opportunity to see him when he was walking on earth as a, as a, as a man in the flesh, but he revealed himself to Paul at a later date. Uh, and talked with him, and they had conversations. So Paul had seen him also, but just not at the same time that everybody else did. Uh, but that first of all, for I have delivered to you first of all, uh, that, that really means that I delivered to you the most important thing, the, the first thing, the very first thing, the important part. I delivered it to you, which, which I also received that Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised on the third day. That is the gospel. That is why we have life. That is why we, we have the opportunity to, to have that relationship. And just as a reminder, uh, I'm going to get to the message in a minute, but just as a reminder, Romans 15, 4 says, uh, whatever things were written beforehand were written for our learning. They were written for us, amen? And we need to learn from them that though that through patience and comfort, through patient, through the, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And uh, I don't think I put these on the overhead. And in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 11, it says, now these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age have come. How many of you think the ends of the age are coming upon us? We need to take heed, amen? And then in Timothy, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. But the question is, how many of you know that there's four, maybe five things that, uh, that are pretty sure and certain once our time is over on this earth, our individual time. How many of you know there's some things that are certain? Amen, you, you don't know? You wanna know? Well, one of them is we're gonna reside somewhere for eternity. And another one is the fact that there's only two possible residing places to choose from. One of them is uh, a place called paradise and called heaven. And the other one is a lake of fire. And you know, we don't hear too much preaching about that, and I'm not a hellfire damnation preacher, but sometimes we need to recall the fact that there's a choice, and the choice is an eternal choice. Uh, whether we know it or not, what we believe about the resurrection of Christ to a very, very large degree determines where we spend eternity. And in case you don't know it, eternity is forever, and forever is a long, long, long time. How many of you know eternity is, is eternal? That's, I mean, it, it just says it about itself, you know? And, and when you think about it, what is, you know, we're doing pretty good, don't you think, if we live to 95 or 98 or 100 or 102? But what is 102 years compared to all the time in the world, to eternity, to, to, to I mean, everything? It's, it's, it's not even a dot on a, on a circle around the world. You know, you can't describe it. You can't, you can't, you can't picture it. But it's eternity. And I think we need to, to help people focus more on, on eternity than we do on what's going on for these few years. You know, Scripture says our life is like a vapor. 
and it's vanishing away. And some of us that are getting on up in years can speak to that more than some of you that are younger. You don't really get the, the picture of that, I think, till you maybe cross over 70 or 75. And then you realize how fast it went. And you wonder where some of it went. And you wonder how you got where you are. But, but we, we just got to realize that. Uh, I believe there's, there's two major, I believe two of the major purposes for celebrating Easter. I believe one is, is for us as believers. Uh, it's an annual opportunity to re-remember that Jesus rose from the dead and he lives forever at the right hand of his Father to intercede for us. I think it's an opportunity for us to, to praise him and worship him and be grateful for what he did for us. And, uh, and, and I think that's something that we sometimes fall a little short on. At least, at least we get complacent and, and we don't take full advantage of who he is and what, he, what he's done for us and what he still wants to do for us. Amen? And, and I believe the other, one of the other uh, important reasons is I believe it gives unbelievers because, you know, during the Easter season, there's a lot of talk about a lot of things, but there's a, a little bit more talk than normal about the resurrection and about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe it gives unbelievers an opportunity to repeatedly, year to year, have an opportunity to, to hear about it and to think about it and to search for God a little more diligently. Amen? Amen. And, and that's, but, but the main purpose of, of Easter is not just a holiday. Uh, now, there's, there's three irrefut irrefutable facts that give us confidence that the Bible is true and infallible. And on these, we can hang our cowboy hats uh, and know that God is trustworthy and that these are the foundations of the gospel. And, and we have read them in that scripture just a while ago. Uh, the first one, he died. And we're going to talk about each one of them a little bit. He died, he was buried, and he rose on the third day. Uh, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, the Bible says, let a thing be established. And, you know, there, there's lots and lots of witnesses in the Bible, and the Bible itself is a, a witness. But, you know, it, the, if, if you study it and, and you listen to some of the scholars that have researched it and studied it, uh, the Bible doesn't stand alone. The historical facts bear out the Bible. You can go back in, in history and in uh, Judaism and, and in that day, and, and it's in the, in the history books that he died. And it's in some of them that he rose again. And it's all verifiable if you go back and look at history. And medical science uh, facts that validate it. Uh, the, the gospel and, and his death, burial, and resurrection. So we, we just need to, to, to get more excited about it, I think. Uh, look at John uh, 19. verse uh, 31. And, and, and the first thing, of course, is that he died. And, you know, there was all kind of rumors uh, back in that day that, you know, his body had just been stolen. And uh, even the guards that were guarding him, they, they went and told what happened. And, and they said, well, you know, we'll give you a bunch of money. And you just tell them, folks, that, that the disciples came and stole him away because you went to sleep. And, he, and if the governors get after you for that, well, then, then we'll deal with them. We'll pay them off too. And they did. And they spread that story all over. But it didn't quite take and it didn't quite last. Amen. But uh, John 19, it says, Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the, on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day or a holy day, and, Jesus, and, and the Jews asked Pilate, that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Uh, back in that day, uh, history says that, that some of the folks lived on that cross for, for two and three days, and, and occasionally they'd make it a fourth day. And, uh, and they, the Jews didn't want them to stay up there, so they asked them to break the legs. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. You know, it was prophesied that, that no bone in his body would be broken. Uh, but one of the soldiers pierced his side, and that was also prophesied that, that they would look on him whom they pierced. Uh, 
And immediately blood and water came out. And as and he who has seen his his scene has testified and his testimony is true and he knows that he's telling the truth so you may believe for these things were done that the scriptures should be fulfilled not one bone of his shall be broken and again another scripture says they shall look on him who and whom they pierced but the blood in the water there was a there was an article in the uh, American, the Journal of American Medical Association, I think it was back in 1986, uh, that, that talked about the, uh, the crucifixion and the death. And, and they said that, uh, it was a group of doctors, and they said that the fact that the blood and water came out, they said probably the piercing came from the right side up to, the, to this side of the heart, and, uh, and that's where the blood and water came out. And they said it proved several things. Number one, it proved that he was already dead when the guards got there. And number two, it proved that he died because his heart burst. He died of a broken heart. Uh, but, but mainly it proved that he was already dead. And, and there was lots of rumors back then, lots of people trying to, to spread the, the thought that he didn't really die, you know. And, uh, but he did die, and there's proof of it. And, uh, and we need to know that he was really dead. He gave his life for us, but they didn't take it because he said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. He came willingly and laid his life down for us. Amen? Uh, so he died. That's for sure. You can't dispute it. I mean, you can dispute it, but it's not logical if you, if you understand the scriptures. The scriptures alone should be enough for us to believe everything that's in there and believe that he died, he was buried, and he was raised again. But those that have a hard time believing, it's good to, to back it up with history and with medical uh, facts. So number two, he was buried. Matthew 27, verse 62 and 66 said, uh, On the next day which followed, the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Least his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went, they made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. And it wasn't just a guard, it was a, a, a centurion. It was a, 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 a garrison, a hundred soldiers guarding one guy on the cross that they thought might try to come down or might do something to get off of it. Uh, so it was, no, it was no meager thing. They, they were prepared. Uh, then we, then uh, the third thing, is he is risen. How many of you know that he is risen? He wasn't, he wasn't, was risen. He is risen. And that's something that we ought to get a little excited about. That's something that we ought to whoop and holler about a little bit. And that's okay in a cowboy church in case you don't know it. Uh, amen. Amen. He is risen. He's alive. He lives within us because he was risen. Amen. Because he is risen. Amen. But uh, Matthew 28, verse 1 says, Now after the Sabbath, the first day of the week, began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Can you picture that? Angel sitting on that big old stone. And it was sealed. It was sealed with martyr as best they could in that day and time. It wasn't just rolled over. And left there. Uh, his countenance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Don't be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus Christ, Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord, where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, 
is going before you into Galilee where you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to bring his disciples word. Uh, verse 9 says, And as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And we've already talked about the soldiers that, that they bribed, uh, and, and that just really didn't work. Uh, but look at John 3, 18 and 19. We did, we did 16 and 17 a while ago. Uh, For God so loved the world that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. John uh, 18, 3, 18 says, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed. You know, a lot of people wrestle with condemnation uselessly. Because when you come to Jesus, it says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to wrestle with condemnation. Somebody appreciates that. Uh, most of us should appreciate it. But uh, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son. And this, is the condemn and this is condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Uh, you know, we used to say when we sold magazines, uh, we, we gave away a good housekeeping cookbook. And uh, if you subscribe to, to five years of good housekeeping in American home, and we had girls that would call on the phone and make appointments for us. And when the first thing they would say on the phone is, hey, we're gonna bring you a brand new good housekeeping cookbook I bet you think there's a catch. Well, you know, a lot of people think there's a catch to the gospel. They think it's too good to be true. How many of you know that, that it's not rational what God did and how he did it? You know, it baffles people. They, they just can't believe that, that just because Jesus died and just because we trust in him, that we are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that our sins are totally forgiven and totally gone. Uh, Dennis talked about it this morning outside. But, but that's the truth. And, and there's not a catch, but there is a part that we have. You know, we have a choice and we have to accept him. We have to, we have to join in to his family by saying, hey, Jesus, I believe that you raised from the dead. I believe that, uh, that you're alive today and I want you to be my personal savior. He took care of the sin on the cross 2,000 years ago but unless you, then it's talked about going and cashing a check. Uh, you know, it, it's like a check. You could win the lottery and you could, they bring this, you know, Publisher Clearinghouse used to bring these big old checks, you know, and have them there. And you could pin that check up on the wall and you could worship that check and you could talk about how rich you are. But if you don't take that check to the bank, you get nothing from it. And you can know all about Jesus. You can know everything in the world about him. You can memorize the Bible backwards and forwards. But it doesn't get you anything unless you join with Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior, and I want to take advantage of what you did for me on that cross. That's cashing the check. Amen? Um, so there is a condition. Uh, Romans 10, 8 gives us the answer to the condition. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word which we preach. And it's talking about the gospel. It's talking about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about. It says that the word which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. You need to confess it out loud. You need to say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You've got to know that he's God and you've got to know that God raised, that he died and was buried and that God raised him from the dead in order to be saved. If you don't believe that he rose from the dead, you're not saved. You've got to accept that and believe that. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Then you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. 
For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And, you know, I don't know if we're all saved in here or maybe if there's a few in here that, that have never trusted Jesus as their personal Savior. Uh, and some of you may be thinking, well, you know, you, you, you don't know how bad I am. You don't know what kind of sins I have. You don't know what kind of life I live. Well, I don't, but he does. And he knew when he died on the cross, everything that you, he knows all about you. You can't hide anything from him. He's, he's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He knows everything. You can't hide anything from him. If you think you got in the dark and in a dark corner somewhere and did something that he doesn't know about, you better think again. Amen? You, you need to know that he knows. He knew before you did it. Amen? And, that, and he knew when, when Jesus, when he gave his only begotten son and when Jesus agreed to come down here, you know, nobody made Jesus come. Do we know that? He volunteered. And he knew what was coming. He knew what he was coming to do. And I, I don't know, sometimes I think maybe some people kind of think that, that he came down here uh, trying to figure it out and, and, and he, uh, he had to work real hard to not sin because if he'd have sinned, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked, you know. But he came down knowing what the job was and, and committed to it voluntarily. And, and the horrible suffering that he went through. And he went through it knowing what kind of sins we had all committed. I mean, there's no way in the world I would bear my soul and share with you all of the things I've done. I mean, you'd kick me out of this thing in a heart, heartbeat. But, uh, but I love preaching and I love Jesus. And, and we've got to know that he forgave our sins. If, if you don't know that, you're going to have condemnation all over you from now on. So you've got to accept it. But You've got to confess it with your mouth. You've got to believe in your heart uh, that, that he'll do it. But look at Romans 5, 7. It says, but God, uh, talking, talking to those who might be thinking your sins are too great for him. Uh, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners. How many of you were still sinners when you got saved? Amen. Amen. Well, he knew your sin. And while you were still sinners... Christ died for you. He died for you, knowing your sins and knowing what, everything that you've done, everything that you'd be embarrassed and want to crawl in a corner for if it was made public. He already knew it, and he died for you anyway. Uh, it says, much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Isaiah says that under the new covenant with the blood of Jesus, God's wrath will not come upon us. Yeah, we may get uh, a little discipline from time to time, but it will not be God's wrath like it was in the Old Testament. Uh, look at Romans. We just did that. Uh, let's see. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, again, Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. You're not waiting to be reconciled. You have been reconciled if you believe that he was raised from the dead and if you've trusted him as your personal Lord and Savior. If you've invited him and surrendered your life to him and he's come into your life, you are redeemed. Amen? You are reconciled to him. Uh, there, there may be some here today who, who are not reconciled or who are not sure if they're reconciled. Uh, but if you've not surrendered your life and confessed him as Lord and acknowledged that God in fact raised him from the dead, uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity in a few minutes, okay? But I want to share a few more things first. Uh, Colossians 1 verse 13 says, He has delivered us he has delivered us from the power of darkness. You know, sometimes we're saved and we still walk in a little darkness from time to time when we're rebelling and when we're not doing what we know we're supposed to do. But he delivered us from that. We don't have to walk in the darkness, amen? We need to walk in the light. In 1 John, it says, walk in the light as he is in the light. You can't even have fellowship with each other unless you're walking in the light. He has delivered us from darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love 
in whom we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And in case you hadn't thought about it, that includes you and me. It says all things were created by him and through him and for him. Have you ever thought about that? He put you on this earth. He chose who your parents were. He, he set the whole thing in progress. For it was fitting. Let me see. No, uh, excuse me. Uh, for by him all things were created. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. Uh, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in all things he may have preeminence. That's a big word, but it's very simple in meaning. It means he wants to be your life. He wants to be what your life is all about. He wants preeminence, not just in your life. He wants preeminence in everything. And he deserves it because he chose to come to this earth in a human body and allow himself to be beat and tortured and, and ridiculed and, and all of that. And he got on that cross willingly. And he gave, up, he gave up his life of his own free will for us so that we would have the opportunity to have the abundant life that he said we could have, that he could have preeminence. Hebrews 2.9 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, uh, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone, for us. He tasted death for us. I don't know if you understand that, that when this life is over, this body dies, but the real you doesn't die. The real you goes from life to life. It goes from life living in this body to life with Jesus. Amen? And that's for eternity. That's forever. Hello? Are you all awake? Um, and, then, and then Hebrews 2, 9 says, but, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it is written for him, for whom all things and by whom all things are, are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. He wants to bring the rest of his sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. He suffered to make us perfect. For both he who sanctified and those who are being sanctified are all one. We're one with him. Amen? He wants us to be that. For which reason he is not ashamed to call you brethren. Do you realize Jesus is not ashamed to call you brethren? He loves us. He died for us. I don't know where anybody is today in their life. You know, it's, it's a great day to, to analyze your relationship with God. What better, what better birthday to have, what better spiritual birthday to have than Easter Sunday? Amen? That would make all of the rest of your Easter's a whole different thing if you don't know him personally. And I just, I want to, and if you are saved and, and maybe you're not fully uh, appreciating all that he did and maybe you don't have that relationship where you just know that he loves you and you just, you just want more to know him more and know him better, uh, maybe, maybe you're there. Maybe you just need to, to say, God, you know, I, I've been ignoring you too much. I want to change that. But, but I think some of us need to make a commitment today. Some of it's for salvation. Some of us need to, to say, if never before, Lord, I want, to, I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be in my life. I want to surrender my life to you. But whatever, whatever God's putting on your heart today, I just, I just plead with you to do business with him. It's a life-changing experience either way. 
if you've been walking with him kind of haphazardly for 20 years and you all of a sudden decide that you're, you've been lollygagging, and uh, is that an East Texas term? Uh, if, uh, if you've been lollygagging for 20 years and, and all of a sudden you're getting this thing in your heart, you know, I've been wasting time. I need to, I need to get on the ball with Jesus. I need, to, I need to figure out his purpose for me. I need to do something, you know, even if it's wrong. Sometimes we have to start doing something. But if that's you, it'll change your life. Amen. So I'm going to ask you if, if, uh, if, if that's you. I'm going to do it in two stages. If that's you and you've been lollygagging, uh, I want you just to, to raise your hand and, and tell him, say, God, I'm through lollygagging. Anybody that's through lollygagging. We don't have any lollygagging. Well, we got one lollygagger, two, three, amen, four. That's great. But when we pray uh, in a minute, I just want you to tell God, God, I'm through lollygagging, and, uh, and, and I'm going to serve you with my whole heart. And I want you, I'm going to surrender totally to you. In fact, let's just pray that now before we go for the salvation. If you raised your hand, just pray this with me. Just say, Father, right now, I know that I haven't been all that you want me to be. And right now, if never before, I want to surrender my entire life to you. I want you to be preeminent in my life and in whatever I do. I want you to be preeminent. And I want to remake you the Lord of my life and surrender to you all fresh and new. And I want to do it right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you ought to be starting to get excited already. Amen. Now, if there's anyone out there who, who's not sure that if you died tonight that you would go to heaven, uh, I just, you know, when I, when I went through my trial times and came back to Jesus, uh, I wasn't even sure. I was saved as a child, but I wasn't real sure. And the preacher had me pray an if never before prayer. And if you have any doubt whatsoever, uh, I prayed that prayer. And when I prayed it, my life changed in a heartbeat. It changed instantly. We talked about change last week. And change happens when you believe something enough to make a choice about it. And it happens in a heartbeat. Amen. So if that's you today... Uh, and you're just not absolutely sure that, that your relationship with him is, is correct and that you'd go to heaven tonight if you died, I just want you to, to raise your hand, and I just want to lead you in an if-never-before prayer. Amen? Don't be bashful. If, if you have any doubt whatsoever, raise your hand and settle it, and I guarantee you, you won't regret it. Amen? Anybody, anywhere? Amen. Well, it looks like we're all born-again believers, and, uh, and we're all... Really glad that Jesus was raised from the dead. Are you glad that he was raised from the dead? Are you glad he's alive? Let's give him a shout. Give him a praise offering. Yeehaw! It's worth shouting about. Amen? Amen. Well, if anybody needs any prayer or wants any, a personal word or something to, to get prayer for, there'll be a few of us down front here. And we are so glad that you all came today. And how many of y'all glad you came to church today? Yeah. Amen. I can tell you, listen, if, uh, if any of you need any prayer or anything, we'll just come up and we'll be glad to do it for you. So let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that, uh, that you are the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. I thank you that you loved us enough to, to give your son so that we could have eternal life, Father. And Jesus, I thank you that, that you were faithful to the end and you, you paid for our sins with your blood and you took all that suffering and, and all those stripes for our healing and for everything that we need. I thank you so much and I love you so much because I understand a little bit about what you did and why you did it and who it was for. And it was for me individually and it was for each of us individually, Father. And I ask you just to stir up in us a, a hunger and a thirst for, for, for to know you better and a hunger and a thirst for your righteousness and a hunger and thirst to be what you made us to be and what you designed for us, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. How do you know when you've been to a cowboy church? Y'all come back now, you hear? <laughs> amen. <laughs>